tonight, this, it's not tonight, but I'm just going to roll with it. Tonight is going to be a good service because we are going to be promoting our salt and light leadership team so that my hope is a lot of you want to sign up and join that. I will talk about that um, toward the end of the message, but we are in this series that is called No Matter What, and the whole concept that Braden started off last week is no matter the circumstances in our life, because a lot of us go through some really bad times, despite that, we can still have joy. And the reason why I think a lot of us don't have joy in life is because we think we get joy from like uh, McDonald's. And what I mean by that is McDonald's is actually my favorite fast food restaurant. And I, I, I have a lot of, <laughs> I, I have a lot of haters for that, I know. But like, come on, come on, okay? McDonald's is the best. And here's the thing, okay? Listen to this, okay? When it comes to McDonald's, I, I crave McDonald's, okay? I'm like, I'm really hungry for McDonald's. And then I go to McDonald's. And at McDonald's, I say, can I have the number, I think it's 10. I always get a 10-piece chicken nugget. And uh, I don't ask for the Travis Scott, no. But they give me the chicken nuggets and the French fries. And here's the thing, okay? I'm kind of bummed. I used to get like the, listen up, guys. This is so important, okay? This is McDonald's, okay? It's McDonald's. Got to listen. Okay. So I used to get the high C orange there that they had, and I loved it. But they got rid of it. Don't know why. Um, I get the lemonade now. And anyway, I tell you guys that because after I crave it, after I eat it, I always feel sick afterward, though, because I just ate all this junk fast food, and um, then I kind of regret eating it. (laughs) And then like a day goes by, and then I want McDonald's again. And I I think that this is kind of like how we think we get happiness in life, is like we try to find these things, we chase after these things that we think is going to make us happy. Like, you know, we get the new shoes, we get the new iPhone, and after we get it, we're happy for that moment, and then we're like, okay, now I kind of want something else. Like maybe you don't really feel good because you thought it was going to make you happy and it temporarily did, but now that, that feeling is there, that wanting to be happy. And I think that's the problem with happiness. We're chasing after it. And let me remind you, Paul right now, as he's writing this, he's in prison, okay? He's, he's in chains. When you're chained to something, can you chase after things? No. You can't chase after things because you literally cannot move. <laughs> Paul is in prison, but he's going to write the happiest book in the Bible, Philippians, where it says joy, depending on your translation, I think 17 times. How is he so happy? How is he so filled with joy? And I think he discovered the secret that no matter what he goes through, he's going to have joy because it's not about chasing after things to make you happy. It's about this inner joy. It's about realizing what Jesus has done for us and that he's always going to be with us despite whatever we go with. And we know that this here is temporary. You see, we can have joy no matter what. I've also realized something that makes me happy in life, long lasting though, not McDonald's, is is when I'm in good relationship with people, when I'm not arguing with people, when I'm not fighting with people, when my relationships are at peace, then I'm actually more joyful in life. That things can be kind of bad taking place in my life, but I'm like, at least I have good friends. At least I have good relationships in my life, healthy relationships. And despite what's going on, I'm like, you know, I'm kind of filled with joy right now because God has placed these people in my life and they are bringing joy to to me. But the problem is so many times when people come into our lives, we start to argue with them and we start to fight with them. And I'm willing to bet that whenever you fight and argue with people, really, you're not happy happy later on. You you don't have this joy inside of you. So what we want to talk about today is those relationships, those friendships And we want to talk about how to do relationships God's way. And we're going to see that through Philippians chapter 2. And through his example, Jesus' example, and what Paul writes to us, we're going to realize no matter the bad stuff happening, if we create good habits with our friendships, our relationships, then we're going to have more joy in our life. So open up Philippians 2 if you haven't already. I know a lot of people were moving earlier when I had you guys do it. But Paul here is writing... And here's what he says in Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from the NIV translation. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, 
if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Here you can see that he's telling the people he's writing to to be in harmony with the fellow believers. Don't be arguing. Let's be people that are united. And then it goes on to say this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Now, there's a lot there that I want to unpack, and I can't talk about all of it, but in this uh, chapter today, we're going to learn some habits on how to do relationships God's way. Let me remind you that we have conflict with people, but remember we had conflict with God, that because of our sin, we were separated from him, and Jesus recognized that, and he came down, and he died on the cross for us. He created peace. Why? Because Jesus is a peacemaker, and we're called to be peacemakers in our life. And if we want to make peace, we're going to practice these habits that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. So the first thing you can write down is this. How to do relationships God's way? Never let pride be your guide. Never let pride be your guide. If you went to Adventure Whitewater, you're very familiar with the word guide. Because whenever we went on the raft, we all had river guides. Um, and the river guides, their job was to guide us down the river, hence their name. Their job was to get us down successfully and not kill us as we go down the river. That was their job. They guided us while we were up there. And just like we had guides while we were up at camp, each and every single person in this room, you have a guide in your life. You have some type of guide that is, that is directing you, that's trying to get you through this life successfully. And obviously the hope is that as Christians, our, our guide is Jesus and what he teaches us to do. But I think a lot of us have this word that I had you write down, or that's already written down for you, pride. I think pride guides a lot of our decisions. I know it does for me. Like, I, I think about myself a lot. Um, I think we all do, right? You wake up in the morning, the first person you think about is yourself. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, you need to smell good, look good for the day. But, like, that's kind of the pattern of our lives is you focus all about you. You focus all on yourself. But here, what were the words I had? I said, Paul said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Okay? Selfish ambition is this. You can write it down. It's when you make everything about you, like everything you do in life, every thought, every action, it, like you think that your life is about you. And the reality is that's what the world's going to tell you. But you know, as a believer, your life isn't about you. It's not. Your, your life is about serving the Lord and doing the things that he wants you to do. But if every decision, everything you do is all about you, all about making you happy, I think that you have some selfish ambition in your life. Now, vain conceit is this. It's when you have an elevated view of yourself. It's like when you think like you're like just so cool, right? It's like when you think that like you're never wrong, like you have just, you're so much higher than all these other people in life. That is vain conceit. And Paul says, do nothing out of those things. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of vain conceit. It says when you do those things, you're acting in the flesh. There's a, there's a verse that I want to read to you um, that's found in Galatians chapter 5. You don't need to flip there. You can write it down. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It says, when we act in the flesh, here's what's going to happen. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. But here's the key ones. Hatred, discord, jealousy, and fits of rage. There's factions and envy. None of those things are good for the friendships in your life. And it says when you focus solely on you and what you want to do, when you indulge the flesh, when you say I'm living life all about me, well, it says it's going to lead to hatred and discord and jealousy. None of those things are going to create harmony in your life. None of those things are going to lead to joy. All right? We have to learn not to let pride be the guide in our life. What's the middle letter of the word pride? I. What's the middle letter of the word sin? I. Sin, pride, it's all entangled. It's when you make everything about you. But as Christians, we have to learn 
to focus on others. And that's what Jesus did. We, we don't have pride guide us. Yes, we have Jesus guide us, but we have this word called humility. Humility should be the guide in our life. And I'm going to talk about that more, but I want you to write this down as the second thing on how to do relationships God's way. Learn to pay attention. Learn to pay attention. Some of us have a hard time doing that, as I could see. <laughs> well, I'm up here teaching the people that aren't paying attention. Um, <laughs> but it, here, the, the thing about paying attention is you have to pay attention to other people to love them well, to serve them well. To, like, you can't meet a need if you don't see a need. Does that make sense? Like, people are hurting around us, and you have to be able to see them to help, to help them out in life. I went to New York like two or three years ago, and I don't know if you've been to New York City before, but there's millions of people there. And we take the subway to get around anywhere, and you would think when you went in the subway, it would just be super loud, people would be talking, all this stuff. No, whenever you go in the subway, it's weird because it's like no one's talking to anybody. Everyone is literally in their own world. They're on their phones, they have their AirPods in, they're reading a book. And I guess they're just doing them. But the thing is, it's, it's such a weird thing. No one is paying attention to anyone. You can walk down the streets and people bump into you. It's like, you literally did not see me there? I, I, I don't want to be a person like that. I, I want to be a person that sees other people and the pain that they're going through. If you don't have good relationships in your life, you probably make it all about you. But if you notice your friendships and what they're going through in the hard times, if you learn to pay attention to them, I think you are going to start to have way better relationships in your life. I want to re read some verses here that I read. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It says, in humility, value others above yourselves. Um, you know, we live in a culture that, that pushes equality so much. And I agree with equality, and I would fight for equality. But I think Paul even challenges those in here to say, yes, understand you're equal, but you should actually treat other people as though they're better than you. That any situation you go into, you, you serve them. That's, you know, servants serve people, I guess, that are better than them. It says any situation you go in and you treat other people as better than you. You realize Jesus serves us, and Jesus is Jesus better than us? Yeah, he is. He's way better than us. He's cooler than any of us. He's God. But despite that, he treated us as though we were better, and he died on the cross for us. And you say, wait, that seems a little unfair if I just treat all, everyone like they're better than me. Well, hopefully they're treating you like you're better than them. That's going to lead to more harmony in our relationships, more peace. We're going to have a lot more joy. We need to learn to pay attention People are hurting. People are lonely. Um, when I was in high school and middle school, like, I never want to be late, okay? I, like, in life still today, I never want to be late. But to my classes, I never want to be late. So what I would do is I would just rush to my class, you know, to the next class, and I would be there early. And I guess it's maybe being a good student, but I missed all the people in the halls that maybe needed a word of encouragement or maybe needed help picking up something that they had dropped. We need to learn to don't just make life about you but focus on the people around you, and that's going to help your relationships. Yes? Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know if you serve people that you're equal with, you know, because it's like, hey, we're equal. But if you, like, like a king, for example, you know, just make up an example. Like a king is like their position's higher. So servants serve the king, you know? So I guess if you look at the people around you and you're like, hey, I'm going to treat them like they're a king or queen and I'm going to serve them, that might be a, there might be more service that takes place if you look at them like that, if that makes sense. But that, that is a really good question. We could talk more after about that for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's the reality, right? Like Jesus was like killed and he served. And um, that's like the example we have also, you know? So ideally, that's what we're, we're aiming for. Um, but God still says love our enemies as well. So, yeah, it, it's hard. Um, with that said, I want to I keep reading here. And those, those are really good questions. I, like, I don't always like ask, answering questions in sermons. I, and sometimes I do. But you can always come up to me afterward also, and we can talk through things. Here's what I want to go into in the next 
portion. It says this in verse 5. I'm just going to read the rest, 5 through 11. Listen to this, and then I'll wrap up with what I'm talking about. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What this just told us right here is that someday every single person that has ever existed, every person you know, every friend, every enemy, every political figure, every athlete, Every celebrity someday will bow their knee to Jesus and recognize that he is Lord, that he is God, and they will confess that with their mouths and they will worship him. That's what it tells us right here. But it also makes it very clear that Jesus served. And that's the third thing that you can write down. How to do relationships God's way? Look for ways to serve others. Look for ways to serve others. It's being proactive also. It's looking for ways. Like I said, it's learning to pay attention. Um, you know, there's... Uh, when it comes to serving, um, I, I think oftentimes what prevents us from serving other people is we think it's someone else's job to do it. I've been watching this funny like YouTube channel. Um, I've actually seen it on Facebook. I assume it's on YouTube. But there's this guy called the Cart Narc. Cart Narc. He, he acts like he's like an undercover agency. I think that's what he tells people. That he goes out in parking lots. And whenever people buy their groceries and put them in their car, uh, and whenever they just leave their cart, like, right there, and don't put it, like, in the, the cart bin, he, like, runs up to them. He records it. He, like, sometimes it's a huge diff or a huge distance. And he, like, woo, 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 just makes his own sound effects, runs over there. And he says, whoa, what's going on here? Why, why are you leaving the cart? And they're just, like, oh, you know, like, I don't know. I just, I got to get going. And then he's, like, why? Are you being a lazy bones today? And he'll just, like, call them out for it. And it's, like, so comical because the people always kind of laugh. And then they realize, like, wow, he's serious. And then they start to get defensive. And they, tr they, they always say, every time they say, well, someone in the store can come out and grab it. And then they get in their car. And then they start to drive away. And the guy chases them with, like, a magnet that has, like, it says, like, cart narc in the number. And he throws the magnet on the car. And then the car always stops. And they get out. They take the magnet. And they throw it at him. And then he starts to drive off. Then he's like, oh, you forgot your magnet. And he puts it on. And normally they get out and, like, cuss him out because they're just, like, so, like, I can't believe you're calling me out for doing this right now. It's someone else's job to take the cart. And, you know, what's kind of true about that is, yes, the grocery store pays people to do it, right? Like, I think we go into situations thinking we don't have to serve because it's someone else's job. That at school, there's janitors to do certain things. At movie theaters, there's people there to pick up whatever mess I left with my trash in there. At sports games, there's people's job to go and pick up this trash. And, yes, that is true, but as a Christian, your job is to serve. So even if that's their job, what does it matter for you? We're supposed to look for ways to serve other people. And we can't let, well, that's someone else's job to do it, get in the way from us being obedient to the Lord. And when you serve other people, you're going to have more joy in your life because people are going to be happier with you. They're going to like you more. You're going to have better friendships, relationships when we serve others. So let's look for ways to serve others. And here's where I want to pivot into talking about salt and light, because um, salt and light is our leadership team. Salt is for eighth grade, and light is for seventh grade. And this is going to be an opportunity for all of you to serve. This is going to be a way for you guys to practice humility by joining these leadership teams. And I'm going to talk the next five minutes about them. But before I do, I, I, want, I want to be very clear, okay? And you can write this down, actually. Every Christian is called to be salt and light. Every Christian is called to be salt and light. My fear I always get whenever I teach like a salt and light message is that if you don't want to join salt and light, you tune out now. But the reality is if you say Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, you are called to be salt and light. Salt preserves things. Back in the day before they had refrigerators, they would have to pack the, the, the meat with salt. That would allow it to last longer. So for us, what does that mean? We're salt. What well, means we preserve this earth the way God intended it to be. We, we, we're obedient to the Lord because by do, being obedient to him, 
then uh, we are helping this world be the way it was supposed to be. And sin leads to darkness. And as Christians, we are light. Matthew 5 talks about this, that we reflect Jesus, just like the moon reflects the sun. Well, Jesus is ultimately the one that's bright, and we're like the moon, and we're just reflecting him here on this dark world. We are all called to be salt. We are all called to be light. But some of you, you want to take your faith to the next level, and you've been looking for ways to do that, and I think salt and light will help with that. You can write this down. Our leadership teams are for those that want to serve and want help taking their faith to the next level. So first off, it's going to help you serve. Um, every single person in Salt and Light, we didn't do this last year because of COVID, but um, if you're in Salt and Light this year, you're going to have some type of job to serve the church, to serve junior high. Maybe that is on a weekend, you're running a snack shack, you're helping with checking, you're helping in the tech booth, you're helping pick up trash. Maybe it's at a TNL. We have so many different jobs there. Everyone will get a job, and it's giving you an opportunity to serve. Um, also, we do community service projects through Salt and Light, which is awesome. We didn't do as many last year, and because of COVID, and we're hoping that like schools let us back in, we're hoping we can still serve like we really want to this year. Um, but this is your opportunity to do just that. And I know a lot of you love when you go out and serve the community. So joining Salt and Light, you have opportunities to serve. But like I said, it's also going to help your faith go to that next level because we're going to push you to be in the Word. We're going to challenge you to be in Scripture. And by reading Scripture, we will find out how, as middle schoolers, God wants us to live our lives and how we can act in faith. If you are in light, what's going to happen is you will have weekly devotionals. Normally, one day a week, you will have something that you need to read. And that means by our meetings, which I should have said, we have Salt and Light meetings every or one Friday a month from September to May. And at those meetings, you will be talking about in small groups those devotionals that you went through. So if you are in light, you will ideally have about four devotionals that you talk about. Salt kind of um, is a little more, and it challenges you more, because by the very end of Salt, you will have read through the entire New Testament. Um, and what that means is almost every day you have a chapter from the New Testament to read. So one day you might have Matthew chapter 1 to read. You read it, took you five minutes. Maybe you wrote some notes in the margin. Next day, Matthew 2. Next day, Matthew 3. Next day, Matthew 4. Next day, Matthew 5. Normally we give you a break every five days, but from September till like May or the first week of June, you will have read through the entire New Testament. So it's more reading, but it might not be as much writing as light because it's not like devotionals where like you, you fill out things. Um, but it's really going to help you take your faith to that next level. And like I love salt and light because it's, it, it, it's the core of the ministry to me. It's the students that I get to know the best. I don't lead a mid-group. I don't lead a small group. And I, I love being able to hang out with the leadership kids and pour into them. Our very first meeting is Friday, September 10th. And that's going to be a meeting that is at the church. But then some of the meetings are actually going to be in homes, um, while others, like our first meeting, will be here at the church. Um, I hope that you guys really consider signing up for this incredible program. Uh, we also do extra like fun things as well with the Salt and Light team. So it's service projects. It's our meetings. At the meetings, like we always have dinner. Um, we always play a game. And then we always have the like devotional small group time and and mid-group time there uh, to look forward to. But if you are interested in doing this, here's what I I'm going to challenge you to do, is today when you go home, you can go to jh78.org, or you can go to our app, or you can go to the link in our bio on Instagram, and you can find the link to this whole Salt and Light application. And there's some qualifications, like your parents need to read through this as well to show like who Salt and Light is for, and it is an application process. We, we take almost everyone that applies, but I will say there are some people that might not always meet all the qualifications that we kind of need to talk through with them to see, hey, are you ready like, to step up and, and meet the challenge of salt and light? But you can go there and apply. You have to apply by August 29th. That's the last fill in the blank. That's when applications are due. It's a Sunday, Sunday, August 29th. And... Um, you can, but you can apply like today. Already, it was, it was open last week. I know some of you had already applied. So you can apply today. You can apply tomorrow. You have up until August 29th. 
and we will email you saying if you got in or not. We will email the email that you put in the application. You need to understand the application will take you some time. It might take you like 20-ish minutes or so, and it has to be done in one setting. Unfortunately, you can't save it and go back to it later on. But check that out. Um, I, I'm just pumped for what, how God's going to use salt and light this year. It's going to give you guys all service opportunities. It's going to help you with humility. I think it's going to help you not make you the focus of your life. So please consider it. I'm going to pray for us right now. Um, if you have any questions about the message or salt and light, I'm going to stay right up here. Come up and ask me those questions. But let's go ahead and pray. Father, I want to thank you for everyone that came here to church today. And I want to pray that you, you convict all of us where um, we've been making ourselves the point of our life. You see, you should be the focus and others should be the focus as well, God. It is an example that you gave us. Help us to put others first. Help us to serve. And I pray that you speak very clearly to those in here that are on the fence about joining Salt or Light. And those that are full on board, help us to be an incredible year. God, it's in your name we pray. Amen.